compliance, it's necessary in this business. Other things, bad things can happen. We obviously know what that can be. So without further ado, Damon Wright, my pleasure, and Benjamin Kinney. Did I say that right? All right. All your needs and compliance. Oh, you guys are mic'd, right? Yep. Hey. The walk-up music was supposed to be a great song, uh, sorry, uh, by Spoon, a uh, phenomenal band out of Austin, Texas. Uh, I put a lot of thought into the, the song. The song is called Hot Thoughts. And that could have been the heading for this program, uh, Hot Thoughts, because depending on whether you have this knowledge or not, you could end up uh, facing a lot of heat. Uh, so we've got updates on legal issues and compliance in 2021. My name is Damon Wright, and this is Ben Kinney, and we're with the law firm of Gordon Reese. Uh, we've got about 1,100 lawyers across the country. I'm the head of the advertising and e-commerce practice group at the firm. I used to be at another firm, Venable, and started representing financial publishers there, and then also businesses selling all variety of different products direct to consumer. And then I came over to Gordon Reese a couple of years ago, and we are looking at VSLs and website claims, testimonials, website terms, uh, Facebook ads. We do that every day, advising clients on how to protect themselves, strengthen their business, grow their business. So that's what we're actually going to talk about, how to protect and strengthen your business, because that's what this is all about. Everyone attending this conference is, no doubt, very smart, energized, determined, creative, You've got all these great qualities that have allowed you to have success and will enable you to have more success. But probably the single most thing that leads to success, above and beyond those, which are all important, is knowledge. You might be, back in the day, you may have been able to run really fast, jump really high, throw a ball hard, great basketball player, soccer player, whatever. But you're not gonna be very good in that game if you don't know the rules. You might be able to score a goal, but you're off sides. You might be able to get a rebound, uh, but you just elbowed someone in the face. And so, if you think about it, to maximize your potential as a financial publisher, or whether you're driving traffic or a copywriter, if you don't know the rules, it's gonna be hard to stay in the game. You need to know the rules to stay in the game. And so again, with determination, creativity, and knowledge, you can achieve your goals. Uh, this is the LA Galaxy after they won the MLS Cup. And uh, the guy on the side drinking a beer, uh, right behind, kind of to the side of Beckham, I had many people send me this photograph asking me if I was in the locker room with LA Galaxy. I have not met that guy, but uh, he's apparently really cool and finds himself in cool places. But I'm told I look like him, so that's why I picked that photo. Anyway, uh, I, I actually posted on Facebook, uh, what an amazing experience or something like that. And I got a, it was, sometimes lawyers fudge a little bit, so that got a lot of likes. Uh, so let's talk about all the different forces that may be looking at your business as you grow. You know, it's kind of like you, you started off with, imagine your business as a, as a campfire, and then it grew to a, a campsite. And then it grew to maybe a little bit of a, of, a, of a little village. And then you put a shack on it, you built a house, then you built a castle. Well, we all know what happens to castles. People try to attack castles. Uh, so you might have people at the front door um, mixing time periods. You might have paratroopers coming in from over the top, uh, people shooting spears, whatever. You want to make sure you've got walls in place, you've got a strong foundation to protect yourself. And you want to protect yourself from FTC enforcement action, SEC enforcement action, consumer class action liability. These are all the barbarians at the gate that can make life miserable for you. And in order to grow your business, you have to know the rules because it'll enable you to go as close to the line as you can, or if you happen to cross that line, to at least know you've crossed it without informed knowledge about the risks, you're making reckless decisions. So, FinPUB, who regulates it? Again, the FTC, the SEC, state attorneys general, often all on top of the FTC and SEC get involved, and individual and collective consumers. 
there's been in the last uh, eight months kind of a roller coaster of activity with the FTC. We're going to talk about that. Um, the, uh, the developments, even as recently as yesterday, have, have changed the landscape. So it's really fascinating, uh, and, and hopefully we can explain this in a way that makes it fascinating for you. But these are the particular, some of the laws that apply to the financial publishing industry. Now let me back up a little bit and explain something in really kind of broad terms that is very important to kind of appreciate. Financial publishing is speech. You are producing information, getting information out to the public. It's protected by the First Amendment, which is a great thing. But the First Amendment treats different kinds of speech differently. And this can be hard to quite grasp because it means that different rules apply depending on the type of speech it is uh, and what the purpose of the speech is. So what is called non-commercial speech receives the greatest First Amendment protection. That is, people can actually say things that are misleading or deceptive to some extent with non-commercial speech. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll come up with ridiculous hypotheticals, but that's the benefit of non-commercial speech. Commercial speech, on the other hand, is speech that proposes a commercial transaction. In other words, advertising. That receives less First Amendment protection. And so with copywriters, it's always important to think, is this going to be considered commercial speech in the realm of advertising or non-commercial speech in the realm of educational or informational content? So this is a good example. Uh, two icons, Carlton Sheets and Robert Kiyosaki. The Carlton Sheets uh, website ad says, become a member for free and get all of Carlton's online courses for free. No credit card or purchase required. And then you provide your information. Now, you can make an argument that that's non-commercial speech because he's not taking payment, that it's uh, just informational, educational, entitled to broad First Amendment protection. But a regulator knows this is really the beginning of the funnel. This is really ad copy. He's trying to pull people in so we can get their email addresses, so we can retarget them to sell them something to get the credit card. So that would be considered by a regulator to be advertising commercial speech. Now, on the other hand, we have Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That's a book. That's not proposing a commercial transaction. You've already bought the book. So that would be considered non-commercial speech. Greatest First Amendment protection, educational, informational. So if you think about it, the exact same sentence could have different treatment depending on how it appears. So if I have a book and I say in my book, if you follow my strategies, you will be a millionaire by age 25, that's protected. It's non-commercial speech. If I have a book and I say, uh, the government is putting microchips in our brains to track all of our movement. Protected, non-commercial speech, all right? But if I have that sentence, uh, if you follow my strategies, you will be a millionaire by age 25, or let me rephrase it, if, if you buy this book, you will become a millionaire by age 25. That's commercial speech, that's an advertisement. I've created problems for myself. So the exact same sentence, depending on where it appears, has different treatment. And, and you need to kind of think about that dividing line as you're writing copy. Now, the basic rules of advertising law are pretty straightforward. Some of them are not always, but they're, they're basically tell the truth, right? Uh, the, the advertisements cannot be deceptive or unfair, and the claims must have substantiation. They must be evidence-based. That's uh, you know, sort of common sense. In some ways, it makes the lawyer's job pretty easy. We, we sort of know, is something true or not? But it, there can be some nuance. Now, one of the big developments over the last several months that you may have heard about is the FTC's uh, enforcement effort called Operation Income Illusion. And 
perhaps people know, the FTC has jurisdiction over uh, consumer protection issues. And for years and years, the FTC has uh, targeted multi-level marketing companies and work from home businesses. Um, more recently, going after businesses that say, uh, we'll teach you how to make easy money on the Amazon or to easy money by being an affiliate marketer. So what are called kind of business opportunity uh, businesses. And they've now expanded into financial publishing. So as you're seeing here on the slide, uh, they announced Operation Income Illusion and said, we're going to go after businesses that are deceiving consumers by creating uh, this, this notion that they're going to be able to make easy money with little effort, passive income. And just uh, for some more background, Ben, why don't you, if you could read from the FTC's press release announcing this. Uh, yeah, so th this is how the FTC uh, introduced Operation Income Illusion. They said, there's a standard movie trope of a group stranded in the desert. Parched and burned, their spirits soar when they see an oasis on the horizon. With their last ounce of energy, they crawl toward the lush palms and beckoning pool. But as they dip their hands in the water, they realize it was just a mirage. For consumers looking to supplement their income and gain financial independence, promoters' promises may seem like that oasis on the horizon. But in many cases, those money-making promises are an illusion. And that's the theme of Operation Income Illusion. The FTC goes on to say, uh, deceptive income claims may be an illusion, but there's nothing illusory about law enforcers' commitment to challenge misleading money-making promises. That's right. Uh, that's uh, courtesy of Leslie Fair, who could actually be a, a really good copywriter. Uh, she's trying to create this image, and uh, you know, we, pick, we all know that kind of scenario of in the desert. And the, the idea is you know, people were struggling during the pandemic, and there were people who were preying on them. On the other hand, we know that there are lots and lots of consumers who are now retail investors who are making lots of money who are very satisfied and, and happy with financial publishing. And the FTC can take a very kind of jaundiced view sometimes that if a business is making money, it must be deceiving people, it must be cheating them. So the FTC announced this Operation Income Illusion and bragged about several cases that it had brought in the past and cases that had just recently filed. Uh, there's a, a company that was sued back in February of 2020, a, a multi-level marketing company called Success by Health that uh, had a coffee product. And the pitch to the, the people in this community was you could sell coffee out of your home. You could sell it to your neighbors, to your church groups, to your book club. Uh, and the people in this community felt like, this is great. I'm, you know, I'm not the drug dealer in the neighborhood. I'm the coffee dealer and I'm making an extra two, $300 per week. The FTC came in uh, without any notice to the defendants, got an asset freeze entered by the court, a temporary restraining order entered, a receiver appointed to run the company, uh, sued not just the company, but three of the owners of the company, all on the grounds that they were deceiving consumers because they said, with success by health, you can have financial freedom. And there are different levels of financial freedom. And if you buy more coffee and you work really hard, you'll put yourself in a stronger position to have financial freedom. That case is still going on. The docket, that's, a, that's a, basically a list of all the filings in the case, goes on for about 60 pages. And this company only did about $3 million in revenue over two years. And when your assets are frozen, you've been sued, your assets are frozen. You've never needed a lawyer more than at that very time. But you can't very easily even get uh, money to pay for gas for your car, much less to pay a lawyer. And so the FTC has been doing this for decades uh, under a statute called Section 13B. Uh, and that's a statute that broadly prohibits unfair, deceptive practices. And they've said to the courts, we have the authority to go in and not even let the defendants know about this case, to, to basically file these papers and get these in this relief, and then we tell them about the case. But the, the practical situation is the case is effectively over. Even though you, the FTC might be wrong, by the time you put on your evidence and introduce that to the court, your company's gone. 
effectively gone. A receiver's come in and taken it, your assets are frozen, you have to ask the court for permission to release your funds to be able to pay your lawyers. So that's the kind of enforcement effort that the FTC was announcing here, saying we're gonna start doing this more broadly. And we're working with federal, state, local law enforcement. Beware, we're coming after you. As Andrew Smith said right here, if someone promises you, you guaranteed income but then tells you to pay them, tell the FTC right away so we can work to shut them down. These are some of the, uh, some of the cases that uh, have been in the financial publishing realm. Online Trading Academy, uh, $362 million settlement and millions more against the owners, forfeiture of cars, planes, boats. Agora Financial, I think we've probably heard of that company before. Uh, they had an offer that, uh, according to the FTC, said that people could effectively get free money from the government through congressional checks. Sometimes they called them Republican checks. There was also uh, an informational product about uh, diabetes. And so that was settled with the FTC, uh, $2 million. And then Raging Bull. That, uh, I've had the opportunity to talk with, with Jeff at Raging Bull uh, the last couple of days. And that's quite a, an interesting story. Uh, I think this photo of Robert De Niro, obviously playing uh, Raging Bull, what was that boxer's name? Uh, Jake LaMotta, thank you, jeez. Uh, the, the, the way, you know, in this photo, his eyes are kind of bruised and battered, but he's still standing strong and counterpunching. I, I really, I think that sums up a lot of what Raging Bull's been through. So in early December 2020, the FTC uh, tried to do the kind of thing I was talking about before. Uh, they actually gave the notice to the defendants that they'd filed this complaint, and they'd filed a motion for a temporary restraining order before the court had signed the temporary restraining order. Uh, but the focus the FTC had on raging bulls that they saying they made uh, earnings claims to consumers about how much money they could make if they purchased, subscribed to Raging Bull's products, newsletters, and also that uh, Raging Bull hadn't properly disclosed the subscription billing terms for consumers. So the FTC came in without any prior notice that they'd been investigating Raging Bull for months and months and, and dropped basically a phone book stack of filings on the court with their narrative, with their exhibits, with their expert analysis, hoping that at that point Raging Bull wouldn't have the, the opportunity or the ability to defend itself because it's kind of like a uh, you know, shock and awe, ambush, blitzkrieg kind of scenario. Raging Bull fortunately was able to hire a law firm, uh, a very good firm, Greenberg Traurig, uh, because they were able to get some money to that firm before the temporary restraining order took effect. A lot of money actually. And it costs a lot of money to defend these cases. That law firm and the people at Raging Bull have done a very, very good job in changing the narrative. Uh, so the FTC said, we want to shut down Raging Bull so we can protect consumers. And Raging Bull responded, we also want to protect consumers. We are prepared to refund any consumers who have problems with anything, but there are all these other subscribers, consumers, who say they really, really enjoy our product. And the FTC's expert, their accounting expert, uh, misinterpreted a lot, made a lot of assumptions about the owner's uh, trading experience and success that were flawed. Oh, and by the way, there are also two, 300 employees in Baltimore that, uh, that work for this company. And we're agreeing to make a lot of changes right now pursuant to this proposed corrective action plan. And we're agreeing to have a monitor come in and oversee us to make sure we're fulfilling all those commitments we've just made. We're willing to do all those things, Your Honor, and so don't enter a preliminary injunction. If you enter a preliminary injunction saying we cannot advertise anymore, we can't do our business, that is the end of the company. We might still have a case at the end, a trial at the end of the case, but it's all effectively all over and done. This judge, so very good lawyers, very good activity by Raging Bull, and then ultimately a very good judge who took a broader view of the evidence. Usually, unfortunately, judges buy into the narrative that the FTC puts out there and, and kind of with blinders on, have trouble looking elsewhere, broader. 
it's kind of a, you know, this is such a bad actor. Consumers are being harmed to such a degree. Just, just rubber stamp what we've got going on, what we're alleging here. So the judge took a broader view and denied the motion for a preliminary injunction, said the company can continue with this monitor. The monitor's going to make reports, and then uh, if the monitor blesses it, Raging Bull can get back to advertising again. And, and some of the claims that Raging Bull made are claims that aren't, and I don't represent them. I'm, I'm looking at this pretty objectively. I'm not trying to be an advocate here. But some of the claims that the FTC attacked were not unusual in the least. And those were the best that the FTC had to focus on. And they don't, uh, they don't provide a representative sample when they file these complaints. They cherry pick the worst claims they can find, and then they tell the court that's the representative sample. So in any event, I think Raging Bulls, the case is still pending, uh, but they've, they've done a very good job of pushing back against the FTC, and they've got, uh, I think, a very good likelihood of coming out of this ultimately a stronger company. So there are three types of advertising claims that often get financial marketers in, in trouble. Future earnings claims, testimonials that report atypical results, and performance claims that lack substantiation. So these are the kinds of things that the FTC was focused on with Raging Bull. Future earnings claims. You can't look into a crystal ball and know exactly what's going to happen. So it's very high risk to tell any uh, potential subscriber, customer, in ad copy that they're going to make X amount of money if they follow your advice, if they purchase your newsletter. Uh, and these are the types of things that, that the FTC has gone after. Learn how to double your money in just one week. Earn thousands working only two to three hours per week. And also what are known as implied claims. And this is a bit unfair. Um, if you're standing in front of a jet uh, or a mansion and you're talking about how successful you've been and how you want to now provide others with that opportunity to have the same type of success, Make sure that you actually own at least part of that jet or that it's actually your mansion. Uh, it's very easy for the FTC to go after someone who's standing in front of a friend's home uh, or a jet they don't own. But these are all earnings claims. And it takes a lot of creativity, frankly, and kind of understanding where the line is to write effective and engaging ad content that avoids future earnings claims. Uh, we review the copy all the time. And when we're doing it, we're not trying to be this rigid uh, you know, worst stereotype of lawyers going through no, no, red ink, red ink, but we're trying to think creatively. How can we still have engaging copy that will convert at a high rate, but at the same time lower risk? And it's, it, it, it takes some work, uh, and it's a dialogue with copywriters, and sometimes we have great conversations with copywriters where they suddenly get great inspiration and we learn from each other. But th that's a, a very important thing to do because, again, the FTC will cherry pick from you know, pages and pages of copy or several hours of VSL to pick out five examples and say, this is what it, everything looks like, which is, of course, misleading by itself. A common misconception is that changing words by inserting could or possible is fine uh, and, and eliminates the risk, but it doesn't. The FTC's view is that those words aren't effective because of the net impression or sort of what does the dumbest consumer take away from what the claims are. I mean, if I, if I say this air conditioning can save your uh, energy bill, can reduce your energy bill by up to 23%, people understand, I think, that that means up to, not always. And you can even look at some of some government documents where they use the words up to in the norm, normal, ordinary way we understand those words to mean. But the FTC's view is up to means typical. That's the takeaway. And likewise, if I said, uh, you could make a million dollars tomorrow, I said could. And yes, perhaps you could if you bought that lottery ticket that had the winning number. It's literally true, right? But no, it's, it's misleading. So I, you understand the point. I think everyone should understand the point. But there are times when it's unfair, and there are times when it makes sense for the FTC to take that position. Damon, yeah. um, you know, one thing that when I'm speaking with copywriters, this comes up a lot, is uh, you know, people say, I want to do X. I want to write or say X. And I know that X is prohibited. So how do I wordsmith this to make it compliant? 
And I think that's really the point there, is that the truth is there, there really isn't a way. The net impression remains the same, and the focus should be really in reframing uh, you know, what you're trying to say. Uh, and so there's not, a, as David said, just a way to insert a could, a word to make something literally true that uh, you know, gives the impression uh, that's, that's a misleading impression. Yeah, it, it, it takes work. We're going to talk about some techniques to be able to get across the points that we want to get across. Uh, but some, these are some techniques for fixing these kinds of future earnings claims. So it's, it's always going to be risky to talk about the future in a quantifiable way, because you absolutely can't quantify x percent return, x number of dollars. Uh, so tr go through your ad copy. And I would say, by the way, go through your, your, the stuff you haven't used, because if you really want to protect yourself, you want to stop using that or clean it up because the FTC will go back several years and find what they want to find, hunt for it. So not just your going forward stuff, but your legacy stuff. Uh, but absolutes are, and quantifiable numbers, if you're talking about the future, are high risk. Puffery is, a, is, is great to use. Now, sometimes it can sound like fluff, and that's kind of what the definition of puffery is. Fluff that no reasonable person would believe. It's not objectively measurable. Words like mind-blowing or game-changing, puffery, what, what does that mean? Also, if you're talking about the future with respect to you know, kind of a macro perspective on industries or uh, certain types of investments, make sure you use words like we predict, we believe. You're not saying it with absolute certitude because, again, you can't tell the future. By using the words predict, believe, it becomes opinion and has a little more First Amendment protection for that reason. And again, we're talking here solely about commercial speech, the advertisements. In the content, which you're actually delivering after there's been payment, there's a lot more protection. And a lot of these rules don't apply at all. So you have to make sure you understand, again, that distinction between the two. Here are the two most important techniques. And this is kind of building on what Ben just said. Focus on the product. How much work, energy, brain power, analytics, proprietary algorithms, artificial intelligence, whatever it is that, that, that is, is the, uh, been brought together to create this valuable product, uh, rather than the profits. And you can also often replace what would previously were forward-looking claims that are high risk with claims that talk about the past, but in an optimistic tone. Now, if you talk about the past performance, though, it, again, needs to be true, and it needs to have substantiation. Oh, and David, can I just, yeah. one thing, I, you know, I think sometimes uh, it's helpful to kind of look at things uh, a little more formulaic, and I sort of, in this space, think to myself that a lot of these promos, they basically say, uh, you know, I, I am, uh, you know, some guru, and I've developed a product. That's kind of the, you know, claim number one. Um, I've used the product, or my friends have used the product, and they've uh, achieved certain results. Those are past claims, and those are acceptable. And then the third claim is really, now I want to give you the product. I want to share the product with you. And so, you know, there might be um, a natural... Uh, fourth claim that would come from that, which would be, you know, and then you'll uh, see the same uh, results. But we stop it after that third claim. Thank you. Um, and, and we don't go, you know, as far as making any future promises like that that can't be substantiated. Great. Yep. Uh, testimonials. So any testimonial you use is effectively your advertising. The same thing is true if you work with affiliate marketers. You might not always, you should, but you might not have visibility into what they're advertising in your behalf, but it's treated as your own content that you authorize, that you're responsible for. And therefore, the same rules apply. The testimonials must be true, they cannot be misleading, and you shouldn't be using testimonials that make these high-risk future earnings claims. And the last point on this slide is very important. The FTC expects that testimonials will either be representative or typical of what consumers have experienced with your product, or you need to conspicuously disclose that they are outliers. They are the success stories. So these are the rules with testimonials. You, you want to substantiate the testimonial. 
Uh, one way to do that is with a provision in your terms on your website that says, uh, with any user-generated content that's provided, the, the, the person represents and warrants that you have the right to use it and that everything they're telling you is true and accurate. And that would be something that you could have just by virtue of a ch click wrap checkbox on your website, that they've agreed to that. People don't read those, though. And so it's really better to have something that's more one-on-one -on -one than that kind of technique. And ideally, it would be good to have documentation showing their trading performance to back up what other, whatever testimonial they have. And in your ad copy, these disclaimers can be worked in to uh, the, the, the copy in a natural way. They don't have to wor look like suddenly the lawyer jumped in and put a big warning sign in the middle of the ad copy. And last, uh, for right of publicity reasons, you always need to make sure you've got permission to use a testimonial. Otherwise, you could get sued for violation of a state's right of publicity law. And, and that's you, the same also for uh, you know, using images of like celebrities or anything like that. That's right. Uh, you also need permission for that. And one more thing I just, as I skip forward, uh, under the FTC's uh, endorsement and testimonial guidelines, if there's any compensation or other consideration for a testimonial, that needs to be disclosed. Uh, that's the same law that applies to Kim Kardashian. If she's posting about how much she loves a detoxification tea drink or something like that, hashtag ad is what's needed there. Uh, the idea is that consumers need to know that maybe this person's perhaps biased because of the fact they've received some, some money for their testimonial. Or they didn't receive money for the testimonial, but they work for the company, or they've got some other benefit. These are excellent testimonials. Uh, they might look familiar. They're, they're on the Financial Marketing Summit website. Performance claims. Uh, you need to have substantiation. So this is in the nature of what we were talking about before, past performance and the backup you need to have for that. You really want to have that backup as you're writing the copy. It's not a good look for the FTC to come knocking or the SEC to come knocking and say, where's the backup for this claim, that claim, that claim, and say, can we get back to you in three weeks or 30 days? You're supposed to have that before you go live with the content. So. Back to what I was talking about before, the FTC has exercised enormous power. I, I talked about this, this statute, Section 13B. They've been using this uh, since the early 70s and kind of incrementally expanding uh, the, the court's interpretation of it as courts have sort of been outcome-oriented and said, okay, the FTC is the cop on the beat. We're going to go along with this. The statute actually says, though, that the FTC has the power to go to court in cases involving unfair or deceptive trade practices and obtain injunctive relief. Injunctive relief means an order from a court saying you must stop doing something. The statute doesn't say that the FTC has the power to go to court and obtain restitution or disgorgement of profits or money damages. It's a big distinction between the two. Nevertheless, for the last few decades, courts have said, well, injunctive relief, damages, it's kind of all one and the same. And the defendants really aren't arguing uh, much in the way of opposition, perhaps because their assets are frozen, they don't have the ability to have good lawyering, but uh, the courts have blessed the FTC's uh, interpretation of Section 13B for decades, but that changed two months ago in this case called AMG Capital. Uh, in this case, the lawyers in AMG Capital argued, no, the FTC doesn't have the power to get money in Section 13B cases, just injunctive relief to say, stop the deceptive advertising. Uh, the district court, found in favor of the FTC. The Ninth Circuit, that's the Court of Appeals that covers California and, the, and some other Western states, uh, they affirmed the district court, said the FTC is right. It went to the US Supreme Court. 9-0, US Supreme Court said, no, the FTC does not have its authority. It does not, and the fact that for the last 40 years, almost 50 years, they've been doing it doesn't make it right. Uh, they can only get injunctive relief under Section 13B. And it's amazing that the justices were all on board with this, 9-0. It's very rare to have this entire Supreme Court agree on anything. But, as I said before, there's been kind of a roller coaster here. Uh, major loss for the FTC. It's gonna be hard for them to bring cases they used to bring until the statute gets amended. State attorneys general, maybe the Department of Justice Criminal Division could get more involved as the FTC kind of lost this power. Uh, uh, but the, uh, there's another statute that the FTC is going to start enforcing 
even more than they have before. And that's called ROSCA, and it stands for the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act. It applies to any business that's selling products or services online to consumers through a subscription billing model. So it could be everything from Netflix to Cigar Club to health and beauty, you know, cosmetics, and of course, financial publishing newsletters, anything where there's a recurring payment. It requires three things, ROSCA does. Uh, first is that there be clear and conspicuous disclosure of the billing and cancellation terms to the consumer. And so typically this would be language on the uh, checkout page of a website. Second thing it requires is that the consumer provide express affirmative consent to those terms. Uh, the easiest way to do that is have the consumer check a box that they agree to be charged X amount each and every month unless and until they cancel. And then the third thing is that there actually be a simple and easy mechanism for the consumer to cancel this subscription. Uh, by calling customer support, by sending an email. In, in other words, that if they try to cancel, they're not put through this rigorous gauntlet of save the sale efforts. Uh, they don't have to call their credit card company and say, I just want to cancel my credit card and charge back. So it's got those three elements. And, oops, wrong slide. This is an example of Netflix's uh, checkout page. And if you take a look at the language at the bottom, that's how they are disclosing and getting consent. So that's elements one and two, uh, disclosing the billing terms, billing terms and having the consumer agree to those. Uh, the, the potential penalty for a violation is up to, this is back to my point before about up to, $43,792 per violation per day. Uh, the FTC's brought lots of ROSCA cases over the years. The first one was against a company called One Technologies that was a credit monitoring service uh, then there was a case against ABC Mouse. There have been another, many, many cases over the last few years. And again, that was a claim, is a claim in the Raging Bull case. Now yesterday, again, we had Operation Income Illusion, and it looked like, okay, the FTC is going to come in and try to uh, you know, take no prisoners. And then we had the Supreme Court decision, AMG Capital, a couple months ago, and it looked like, oh, okay, the FTC's been knocked down. And, and then yesterday we have this settlement in a Roska case against MoviePass. And so it's, it's really been interesting to watch, but in the MoviePass case announced yesterday, uh, MoviePass, you might know, charged $9.95 to watch movies in theaters uh, as many times as you want per month. They went bankrupt about a year ago. The FTC had a settlement with them announced yesterday, and the FTC used, this, used Roska to try to circumvent the unfavorable decision in AMG Capital. Now, we just talked about Roska, and we talked about the disclosures. The FTC's theory is that, uh, back up there, uh, is that because MoviePass made it hard for people to actually use their membership, that MoviePass actually hadn't conspicuously disclosed the terms of the offer, and therefore, MoviePass violated Roska. So it's, in like, it's like the FTC's taken a, a statute that really is about disclosure of billing terms and trying to expand it in, and transform it into a false advertising statute, and that's because they want to be able to get damages. Uh, so anyone out here who has any product or service you're selling on subscription, it's very important that you make sure you comply with ROSCA and recognize that now ROSCA is going to be interpreted by the FTC to not just be a billing disclosure statute, to, but to be an advertising claims statute. Okay, uh, one easy way to avoid class actions. This isn't a recent development, it's been around for quite a while, but I wanna make sure everyone knows this because it is the simplest thing you can do to protect yourself from consumer class action liability. On your checkout page, have the consumer agree to your terms of sale and have the terms of sale hyperlinked so they can click that and they can then read it. And in the terms of sale, you need to have mandatory arbitration and class action waiver provision language. If you have that and it's well written, consumer class action lawyers almost, I'm making kind of a bold declarative statement, but it's uh, virtually uh, next to impossible that they're gonna take the time and the effort and the energy to ever bring a consumer class action against you. Because that kind of language has been uh, broadly interpreted, the consumer class action waiver mandatory arbitration language is broadly interpreted by the US Supreme Court. And instead of bringing a class action on behalf of all your subscribers who relied on something, with that language, 
it can only be an individual consumer bringing an individual arbitration for their individual damages, as opposed to millions of dollars, thousands of consumers. So on your checkout page, in your terms, you should take a look and see if you've got that kind of language. If you don't, you should add it. We've got not much time left. We've got ben, not much you, time. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Damon. So uh, there's a couple of other um, acts and rules that you guys are probably already generally aware of. Um, but given that we're talking to you about compliance, we think it's important that we at least mention it. Uh, so the first is the Advisors Act. This was uh, passed in 1940 in response to uh, the Great Depression. Basically, uh, the act uh, called the uh, Advisors Act generally uh, makes investment advisors register with state and federal regulators. Uh, the act itself has basically five categories of requirements. It's, uh, there are certain contractual requirements. Uh, the investment advisors have fiduciary duties now to clients. Um, there are some other substantive prohibitions and requirements. There's record keeping requirements. And there's the ability of the SEC to uh, give substantial oversight. And what this means is actually they can come in uh, and, and review uh, you know, your, your records. Um, so it's a huge, huge undertaking if anyone is actually subject to the Advisors Act. Now, thankfully, there is an exclusion to uh, the investment advisor definition, and that's an exclusion for publishers. And the act reads that any publisher of a bona fide newspaper, news magazine, or business, or financial publication of general and regular circulation uh, is exempt from the definition of an investment advisor and then uh, does not have to comply with all these additional requirements. So the Supreme Court has looked at this and said that basically this exemption, what it means is that, uh, that if uh, publications are you know, not offering personal investment advice to the public on uh, a regular basis, basis, then they fit under this exclusion and are not subject to uh, the Advisors Act. Um, application of the publisher's exemption is very fact specific, so it totally depends on just what your interaction with your customer is. Uh, but the key issue is whether the publication is only offering information, uh, impersonal general investment advice, and does not tailor the uh, investment advice to the specific consumer. Uh, and that's the key here in order to maintain your exemption as a publisher. Um, so, you know, the newsletters that go out, the promotions that go out generally uh, in this space, a lot of what I've seen, you know, goes out to the general public and is not specifically tailored to anyone. But there are other aspects of your business that are more individually tailored. And so this is why you really need to be uh, aware of this because uh, you really want to maintain your exclusive status or uh, maintain your exclusion. So, uh, you know, areas of your business that, you know, lend itself to um, more personal advice are things like uh, uh, investment education parts where, uh, you know, you might have a live Q&A section and uh, you know, your consumer will ask you a specific question about their specific situation. In these, uh, in these arenas, you have to be very careful not to give personalized investment advice and uh, really stick with you know, answering questions about uh, your product and not about investments tailored to them. Uh, there's also uh, lots of uh, ways that you know, securities fraud can come up. Um, we, could, is, we, could, we could spend an hour just on this. Yeah, we, I mean, I, and I listened knows. to a podcast the other day uh, with uh, a retired um, federal prosecutor, and uh, you know, he was talking about securities fraud can really mean anything these days uh, because there are new cases coming up where um, you know the SEC is bringing security fraud cases relative to climate change or relative to uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. So it's really been expanded. Yeah. Uh, but in this space, we wanted to basically uh, you know, mention um, pump and dump 
to you guys, okay? So securities fraud, section 10b-5 says that it's unlawful to employ any scheme to defraud, to make any untrue statement, or to engage in any act which operates as a fraud or deceit in connection with the purchase or sale of securities. Uh, and so, you know, to protect ourselves against uh, pump and dump schemes, which have, you know, gotten a lot of attention uh, lately, I mean, there's a lot of new areas that uh, are potentially ripe for pump and dump schemes. Uh, we want to make sure that we make material disclosures, uh, such as whether the gurus who are pushing these uh, investment uh, picks, these stock picks, uh, whether they hold any stake. Uh, and then, you know, we can make a disclosure policy that we can, you know, that policy itself, uh, we can disclose uh, to our consumers about whether or not we permit our employees to buy and sell stock. And we can write a policy and we can say generally, you know, we're all for uh, our employees participating in the stock market and uh, our employees who, who um, make picks, uh, they might hold stocks. Uh, and when they do, we'll tell you if they hold uh, the stock that they're picking. Um, and also, we restrict their uh, ability to buy and sell stock, you know, maybe on three, three days in either direction. If you're going to pick a stock, we have a policy that our employees can't buy or sell that stock uh, three days before or after the pick goes out. Uh, and this is really just going to protect you guys because this is uh, getting a lot of attention right now. And so we're pretty far over, and we did want to open it up to any questions if you had them. Uh, lastly, I was just going to say that there is some particular regulatory interest in uh, a couple of uh, you know, emerging areas right now. The first, obviously, is cryptocurrency. And uh, you know, since October 2020, the FTC has received more than 7,000 individuals, reports of more than 7,000 individuals, uh, you know, falling prey to cryptocurrency scams. Um, meme stocks are also very huge right now. I think everybody knows about uh, GameStop and uh, AMC and some others, BlackBerry and stuff. Uh, you know, the SEC has, um, has turned their attention to these things, and Congress has turned their attention to these things. Uh, so there's no general prohibition that, you know, you can't talk about these things in your copy. Uh, you can't have, uh, you know, themed promotions revolving around this. But just know that when you do that, uh, there is going to be some added uh, scrutiny um, because of, you know, this is just a, an emerging area and it's very susceptible, susceptible to, um, to issues of, of fraud yeah. uh, and deceit. Yeah, a few years ago, people might remember the, the binary options craze, and a lot of affiliate marketers got involved with that, and they had business opportunity kind of copy about make money flipping real estate, make money with your Amazon, building an Amazon store. They, you know, they were different offers, they were getting paid a CPA, and the binary options community uh, came in and said, we'll pay a much higher CPA, just take your emails that you blast out on your list and just replace the words real estate with binary options. The reason I say that is because it reminds me of some of the activity that the, FTC, or the SEC is looking at now, or the CFTC as well. A lot of those folks ended up getting prosecuted by the SEC and CFTC affiliate marketers, and they had no idea what binary options were. They just thought, okay, it's just another vertical, another product. And so the issues with securities fraud and being an unregistered broker-dealer are real issues. Uh, if you're selling skin cream or you're selling make money on Amazon, those issues don't apply. But when you're selling a security, totally different game. And, and I'm, I'm saying that knowing that I think everyone in here understands that full, fully well. Uh, sometimes my language is garbled. Understands that very well. How about that? Uh, so in any event, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, we're a couple I, minutes I saw over, a lot so. of pictures. Is there any way to get those slides? I know they're probably really expensive. <laughs> Can they get the slides somehow yeah. or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How oh, would they get the slides? And also, well, we should recommend the guide. Yeah, so um, a couple things. Uh, yeah, we're happy to email anyone the PowerPoint. And more importantly, though, um, there's something that, that we published called the e-commerce retailer. Oh, it's back here. I can pass it on. Yeah, the e-commerce retailer legal guide. And this has 15 sections. Each is only about two or three pages long. And it's 
basically uh, covers every single legal topic or concern important to an e-commerce retailer and addresses in not legalese. Just raise your hand if you want a copy of this. Yeah. Uh, best practices for protecting yourself. We don't have that many. If we so, run out of copies, we can get you guys copies. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, if you, it's not only going to protect not. you from liability, but it's going to add value to your business. We also talk about things like trademarks and copyrights, state Are sales there more tax. of these or no? Um, They're hot. Yeah, yeah. We're, we'll we, we we'll can, get we'll copies. Email, okay. yeah. Yeah, come up to us and we'll send you the link with it. And even if you've got a hard copy and you want us to send you the link, we can do that. But yeah, it's, a, it's a, probably $100,000 of legal time went into this. Uh, seriously. Uh, it's really comprehensive. So it'll save you money in not having to hire lawyers. 100. Who wants it? 100 bucks. Who wants it? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and I will tell you, and this is going to sound like an earnings claim, but I think I can substantiate it if I had to. <laughs> it will save you or could make you millions of dollars. Uh, seriously. I mean, and I, I was at an uh, e-commerce legends event last week in Fort Worth, and there were a lot of um, businesses there that are right now rolling up Amazon resellers in different verticals. I mean, th this is not focused singularly on financial publishing, but just direct to consumer. And uh, the, the companies that are trying to sell themselves understand, I think, from, from that conference, based on the conversations we have, that if they just put in a little bit of time doing some cleanup, just like a real estate agent goes in and stages a house and puts flowers and bakes cookies to make that house look better, or you wash and wax and vacuum your car before you sell it, if you're trying to sell your company, doing some of the things here will, uh, that will not really be very expensive can save you, or make you, I should say, a lot of money. We have a question here. Yep. He tried to ask the non-compliance guy yesterday for 20 minutes, so. <laughs> yeah, what's the email address to ask for the document or the slides? Thank you, that's a great idea. Uh, D. Can you tell that to us? <laughs> very good question. Uh, D, for Damon, Wright, that's W-R-I-G-H-T, at grsm.com. Dwright at grsm.com. Do we have any questions at all? OK. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, regarding Rosca in the third, regarding the third step of Rosca, yeah. regarding uh, the, how easy it is to cancel, right, right. what is the rules around something like a retention, like yeah. how far can you go with trying to keep them in your ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, so there is no, um, the statute doesn't speak to when have you crossed the line. Um, and one thing I should mention is that there are states that have analogous statutes to Rosca, and California is one, and California requires that if the product is sold online, that you have to offer the ability for the consumer to cancel online. Uh, it can't just be a customer support phone call. Um, but, but generally, the save the sale effort I would say the customer support person can, can make one polite diplomatic effort to save the sale, to say, you know, we're, we'd love to keep your business. Uh, what was your experience? Can I tell you more about the product or offer you anything? And, and you know, we you know like XM Radio does that, right? That's, I think a regulator won't have a problem with that. Again, the statute isn't specific. But if the consumer says, I'm not interested, then that needs to be respected. It can't be, well, hold on, I want you to talk with so-and-so, and then the person's on hold for a long time, and then they go through this, again, a gauntlet. It can't be that. So it needs to be a situation where, and I've had matters, the one technologies matter. The FTC asked to listen to all the recordings of customer support over like two years. And I mean, it was just ridiculous, and, and they didn't go through them all, but you want to think to yourself, what if this recording is played back to a regulator of this communication between the call center and the consumer? How are they going to react? Legal advice right now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even want, what's your bill? Can you tell us your billing rate? 700. Oh, that's cheap. That's right. cheap. Okay. $12 right now? Is that what's that's cheap? Um, so I wanted to ask you about the, the, the line that is general and regular. So here's what I mean. So I've had different lawyers tell me different things about where you cross the line. So for example, if it has to be general and regular, so I, I tried to get around that by kind of pseudo collecting personally identification information. And they said, well, depending on how much information you collect, then they could arguably say, well, because you know this information about the customer, you are now providing, quote, individualized advice. 
So we've tried stuff where we wanted to target <clears throat> people with smaller accounts. So it's like, right, how to turn a small account into a big account, or like a $5,000 trading account, or if we're going for higher net worth people, or if it's for dentist or something, kind of more niche yeah. type newsletters to get you know, certain audience segments. So like, at what point do you cross the line from this is a general and regular newsletter for accredited investors that are dentists to this is now individualized advice because you're getting too specific with the, with the target? Yeah, it's a, it's a matter of degree, as you just pointed out. And if it's a, and there's surprisingly, there's not that much authority out there on the publisher's exclusion, but if it's a demographic, a segment, that's not getting to the level of customized, tailored, individual, individualized advice. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, I can't give legal advice without knowing all the facts, but if it's simply because this person is in this income strata, we're gonna target them with this, uh, and everyone else in that, in that strata is gonna get targeted with this, I don't think that's gonna present an issue with uh, perhaps you know, losing the exclusion. Ben, and, and I think you should know that a lot of these regulations are somewhat frustrating because there's no bright line rule. There's a lot of gray area. Uh, and so one of the things that you know, we really try to do uh, is we try to just make the business you know, aware of the risk and we try to you know, uh, obtain the business's risk tolerance. Yep. Uh, and you know, if you're not very tolerant to you know, any amount of risk, then uh, you know, we would say don't collect that information, right? But, um, <laughs> But you know, there's a cost to that, and it could be uh, you know, lower subscribers. Uh, so, so there's really a balance, and, um, and that's what we you know, try to come in and, and help the business uh, you know, find their balance. We got another question over here. So uh, the whole time I was just trying to figure out how much of this applies to me. It's kind of a unique situation. I have a uh, financial education YouTube channel. Okay. I have no product, okay. but I do make money from the channel. YouTube pays you, and I have affiliate deals as well. So even though you really wouldn't have to protect the consumer so much, because all I'm really taking of the consumer is their time, right. I suppose, how much of what we just saw today, you know, if any, do yeah. I need to watch out for too? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, like my email address was a great question. Um, no. <laughs> Bill Inray so, wasn't a good one? Yeah. So. Your YouTube channel is providing educational, informational content. You're not selling a particular product, right? Okay. And uh, the affiliate compensation you're getting, is that just because you've, you've got uh, a sponsor for the channel? Or how, how is that coming in? Hold on one second. Sorry. 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 I've always uh, looked at sponsors different than affiliates. Sponsors typically just pay you just to be seen, just for the exposure, to where affiliates you can actually measure. You know, they'll give you the link, and right. they can actually see where the traffic's coming from, and right. they, pay, they pay you accordingly. So uh, how, I have the latter. I have, it's, it's all affiliate deals. Okay, so consumers on, on your YouTube channel and clicks a link in the, beneath the video, how, how are they, or is there an ad that's popping up on, during the video? No, it's not an actual ad. It's uh, just like you said, it's a link okay. in the video, and the same is on my uh, website too. Okay. And that link is going to the advertiser's website? Going to my affiliates, and if they just sign up through there, you know, they, they see my suffix on it and they know it's me. Okay, all right. Uh, based on what you're saying, I, th I think that you probably, I, I wanna better I'd look at it, and, and so take this with a grain of salt. I think you're probably in the realm of non-commercial speech because you're not proposing a commercial transaction. You're certainly not taking any credit card payment, but you, but if you, on your YouTube channel, said, let me tell you about what's going on with crypto right now, or let, let's talk about uh, currency trading, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and while I'm at it, let me tell you about this amazing software that you can use as a platform for all your trades. Then it might go from non-commercial to commercial. Uh, and, and that means you've, you had broad First Amendment protection, but when you start pitching, you've suddenly lost that and, and you become yeah, you're in the realm of commercial speech, but it sounds like what you're describing is probably in the realm of the highest First Amendment protection. It's educational, information, informational. It's like the Kawasaki book. Yeah, that's, I'm glad you said it that way too, because I do what you said, I isolate it 
into their separate videos. So I almost kind of run a commercial just for them. I don't say, hey, the market's going nuts right now. If you want to take advantage of it, go here. Right. I just say, hey, here's why I like them. End of story. Here's the Yeah, link. yeah, yeah. And the same thing comes up. You know, I, I represent some influencers who have channels talking about the latest health and wellness products. And they have a supplement company that sponsors their channel. Uh, but if there's too much of a connection between the substance of that conversation on the YouTube channel and that product, it starts to look like an advertisement. If it's totally disconnected, on this episode, we're talking about CBD, and this product is vitamin C, that's the sponsor of the channel, but that's much easier to say that it's not commercial, there's, that it's not this connection. Does that make Thank sense? It does. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. I've, a big round of applause. Thank you.